to get into this thing one time. Plenty, plenty thing to cover still, boy. All right, well, this morning we was discussing the, the um, judgment for all, for all those who um, wasn't here, and we was discussing certain points about the judgment. Right? We discussed that the judgment um, is a pre-advent judgment, a judgment before the second coming. We went into a, a little exercise this morning whereby we showed from the scripture that, that each point of these um, truths of this judgment is indeed a biblical, um, has biblical basis then or, or ground. So it's not something that, that the pioneers of Adventism came up with and because we are unique to the other evangelical churches is that we have this unique teaching that, you know, like how the watchtowers have the, have the unique teaching, the moments have the unique teachings. It's not a case like that. It is indeed unique. Unique in the sense that God has called the Seventh-day Adventist Church to, to, to present. It's like uh, the gospel was given. And as we know that, that, that during the history and of the church, the church went into apostasy because Paul pro prophesied about the man of sin, which is the papacy who was to come. And he said the man of sin wouldn't come unless the first be what? A fallen away. So we know in history, a fallen away had occurred where the gospel purity, the truth that, that, that the apostles and, and them preach and teach, some point in time, a wrong 180 coming down, the gospel started to get corrupted with all sorts of strange teaching where Mary worship statues and a whole host of different things. Of course, I mean, for those of you who might want further information, I mean, the book Great Controversy is a very, a very excellent book to, re to really read up on to understand what this apostasy was like, right? And with that apostasy, you know, it, it just continued you know, developing and developing until we had the papacy coming on the scene. And the papacy, when the papacy came on the scene in, in all its glory and its strength, at the time of when the pap papacy was an established power in Europe, those days were known as the Dark Ages, Middle Ages. The reason why it is called the Dark Ages because by that time, the truth of the gospel of Christ, that the apostles and Christ and them had labored to spread to the world had become so corrupt that there was almost as though like there was no light. But we know God in his word always have a remnant. It always had faithful people throughout the ages that had the light of truth with them. As, as Ellen White say, it might have been as almost as though it was to extinct, but the light of truth never went out. But during the dark ages, we understood that, that, that truth was not common. It, it wasn't known. Hence, people was in an era of great spiritual darkness or, to the point where people actually go into this apostate church, the Catholic church, and paying for salvation. That is to show how far the concept of grace had deteriorated that, that, that people were paying money for salvation, paying money. That, that, that their loved ones who had died and passed on, that some idea of purgatory, that, that they would be, be delivered from some pur purgatory hell. And, this, and such was the, the, the um, state, as history show, of the gospel again, so dark that, that Seventh-day Adventists now came about in, in, in a time where we were called the restorer of the breach. We were called to restore back the gospel truth to the face of this earth. But in order for us to be that restorer, we had to get the truth clear, learn it well. God had to, to bring back all of these principles. And, you know, as the year went for, forward with, with the pioneers, the pioneers and them, their labor was not in vain. Their labor wasn't a labor based upon the things of this world. It was concerning God giving them these truth, bring, bring it back to the earth to prepare people for the end. Because the end is right at the door, at the corner. So these are some of the um, truths we, we understand, the pre-advent judgment. Revelation chapter 14, verses 16, we, we read of, um, for the hour of his judgment is come. Fear God. So we touch 
went into scriptures, showed that the idea of a pre-advent judgment is, is not a foreign thing to, to the Bible. It is a biblical thing. The idea of a judgment where you have um, the first phase of the judgment, commonly called the investigative judgment, began in 1844 and is now in progress. So we have Daniel chapter 8, verses 14, which is established in a, until 2,300 years, then shall the sanctuary be, be cleansed. With that understanding, we come to establishing the beginning of the judgment, which began in 1844, and it started with the dead. So, so the judgment is a judgment of the dead and will end with the living. So, so we get the idea of a judgment of the living and the dead. Again, we see in, in, in the Bible from the Virgin participating and quoting scriptures showing that indeed it is a biblical teaching. We have um, judgment according to works. It is a judgment and there, and there seems to be this conflict in theology, in the circle of theology where judgment according to works is not in harmony with this so-called idea of a justification by faith, which is really a false idea of justification, right? So with, with the wrong idea of justification by faith, one would have a problem with the idea of a judgment according to works. Right? So we see, again, we would be judged according to works. We also see that books are used in this judgment. Three books are mentioned. Book of life, book of remembrance, book of iniquity. We see in Daniel, books were opened and the judgment was set and so forth. We see all the heavenly hosts in this great heavenly tribunal stand before God and it says, and books were opened. So we see it is really a, a, a proceeding, a court proceeding, where the lives of individuals is on trial. We also understand it is really a judgment in absence. We don't have to be there to be judged. We are judged based upon the books and what are written in those books. Again, we see the standard of the judgment would be the law of God. We don't accept this idea that the law of God abolished and, and all them sort of nonsense what is, is, is being taught about the law of God. We need to have the law in its right perspective. The, um, the gospel and law, they, they, they go hand in hand. You can't have a gospel and don't have a law. To have a gospel as what is being preached today in the world without a law is no gospel at all. Right? So we have also the proceeding of the judgment where we see it's three phases. The judgment has one judgment but in three phases. We have like the investigative part, the verdict, and the execution. Right? In, in, in our own common court proceeding in Trinidad and, and in, in America and around the world, we see the very same thing. So we, we see where, where those nations get that idea of um, judgment and the, the proceeding of um, where you have um, a trial. The trial is, is, is really the what? The investigation. And after the trial now, you have what? A verdict. And the verdict, as we, we, we know, is the decision that is being made after the trial. And after the, that verdict now, we have the carrying out of that sentence, which is known as the, the executive part. So this is how the um, judgment is in heaven. It have um, a trial, which is going on right now. Mind you, the lives of men are on trial. <laughs> we do not know when your life or my life might come up in that trial, but nevertheless, lives are on trial right now, and it is in progress right now. We do not know when the judgment will come upon the living. So that is a, an another thing for, for us to bear in mind. You also see forensic justification, which blots out our or forgive our past sins in the judgment. You know, this was one of most of the, the debated position in the Adventist church in regard to a judgment, where people doesn't seem to understand that, that when God, when God decides to save man in the plan of salvation, God does things in order. God is a God of order. So he does things in, in, in order. When we are justified by faith, we are forgiven of sins of the, of the carnal mind, sins of the heart, right? That is God dwelling, dealing with sin in us. 
The sins what we have committed and done that, that are past, that is not dealt with. That is dealt with at a later time, which is dealt in the judgment. On faithfulness of your conversion and your sanctification, your walk in sanctification, when you are faithful and you, and you come up into the judgment, then God will blot out your past sins. So that is called the forgiveness of your past sins. So you have these evangelicals who teach so much, so much a heresy where I remember reading in a book where a guy said, um, when you're justified, God forgive you of your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. I mean, they even go so extreme to show, show, show that when you justify, your past, present, and future sins are justified. And hence the reason why they, they, they could tell you, no matter what you do as a Christian, I mean, brethren, I put up a, um, a YouTube um, program on the internet which I showed a little clip with our pastor, and, the, and this guy is saying, no matter what you do as a Christian, you cannot lose your salvation. And even when so far to even say, even though if I go out and commit murder and kill somebody, he, him, him, my salvation would not be at, at stake. No. He said, but nevertheless, God will make sure I pay for it in this life here. But I am saved. I will not be um, I'm lost. And he goes on to show how Christians do sin. And this man speak with such confidence. I was like, my God, this is what Christianity reached to where pastors stand up on a pulpit and telling you that it is okay for you to sin. No, no, I understand why. Because again, the false doctrine, the false theology, the idea that, that, that when you're justified, Christ obeyed in your place. And no matter what you do, what Christ has done for you is so settled. It's such a seal and sign deal. And again, this idea of um, eternal security, all of those ideas coming down tr throughout the dark ages, all this confusion of thoughts in the gospel that is still here with us, where we have all those wrong ideas and understanding in regard to the judgment. This man speaks so bold that it's okay to, uh, to, to um, sin, and that is it. So we have also now two destinies are possible to those who have profess Christ in the judgment. You have eternal life or eternal death. Those are the only two possible outcomes. So don't expect no other. Wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and this study has, has been a real challenge. I mean, so, <laughs> so many different challenges. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, the show must go on. Right? The show must go on. So we get the idea of... Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how bold they really became. Yeah, it, the, the logic is in their understanding. Yeah. 
what it is. That you're going to live in sin. sin yeah. But are you saying that? That is what it's saying. But the devil, when you look in Genesis for a lot of things, yeah. he's setting a mask. He's really doing. But I'm not saying that he's right. And he's not going to fight it. I'm just saying, some of that's that, and I'm going to take that. <laughs> you know, take it off the second plane. Yeah. You want to live in sin? Yeah. I can live with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, as you talk about that, it, it brought my mind back to Calvin and Calvin, Calvinism. Now, what Calvin established based upon his idea of predestination, while he wasn't willing to go to the logical conclusion of, of what he said, other people after Calvin came, they saw the implication and they were true to the idea. They, they didn't shy away, so they, they, they went extreme. Yeah. But their extreme, what, 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 what we call an extreme, is really according to their logic. In it. The logic is that if God is both good yeah, and, and evil, evil yeah. then the idea of um, salvation and a person um, yeah. being saved, and, yeah. I mean, it just takes it to the full extremity yeah. of the teaching. Yeah. So, so as you're rightly saying, these people, based upon what, what they believe, certain persons come and they see what the implication is, and they just went further. And most of them, as they, as they say they, again, they're not honest. Because even so, if, if you're honest about what you're saying, at least go based upon what you're saying. If you're saying how that works have nothing to do with salvation, then come out and plainly say, well, it's really salvation in, in sin. You know, I sat down ho home day and I reasoned in my mind this idea of, um, this idea of, uh, uh, you know, which is even common in Adventist so, um, so because they always make the issue the body. As long as you're in this body, you must sin. And I sit, sit down and I reason. I say, but wait now, boy. If these people say the problem, yes, I think I, I, I was doing the, the study and the, the thought came and I just write down yeah, the points now. Right? Write down the, the, the point. It says there, right? The issue of sin is not the body of man. So they're making the issue that, that as long as you're in this body here, you must sin because the flesh has some kind of pull into what sin and, 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 and your nature is sinful. And, so they stress on the issue of Sin has been the body. Right? So the issue of sin is not the body of man, but the heart of man. So Christ made, made it clear. The problem is to cleanse that which is within the cup first, that the out might be what? Clean. So we know the cleansing of, of the inner the cup is the heart of, 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 of man. And he even went further to show, for out of the heart of men proceed all of these type of sins and, and evil, right? So the issue of sin is not the body of man, but the heart of man that is the root cause of man's sinfulness. So the root cause of man being sinful is not his nature. Because if it was his nature, well, in my un understanding, nature is something unchangeable. If this is a plan by nature, you can't do nothing to, 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 to change that by nature from being a plan. By nature, it is a plan, and it will always be a plan. So, so if, if you're making the issue that, that, that sal salvation and the issue with men being sinful is based upon some idea of, of, of a nature, there are some sinful nature, then what salvation Christ really coming to, to, to effect? He can't effect a salvation unless he, he comes with something to change the nature of man. It is only logical. If the issue of man is his body, then whatever plan of salvation God or Christ coming with, if it doesn't address changing the physical nature of man, is no salvation. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's the mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an old English word. But I often try to be, to, to be very clear because the scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart. We don't think here. We think here. So, <laughs> so it's an old English word that, that King James and then at that time they, they use it to mean the mind. All right? So, yeah. 
Something, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 yeah, something else. Yeah, something else. Yeah. So the thing about it is that their idea salvation, sure. contrary to what we do, is not from sin. Salvation is not from sin. Sin, no. It's, it's not salvation. It's from the consequence yeah. of sin. Of sin. Well, it's <laughs> not sin. Yeah. Because if some. Yeah, because it, it quite clearly says mm. that when Jesus comes, you can't get sin. Yeah. You'll get a new nature. Yeah. You'll be a new nature. Yeah. You'll be a transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Of sin, yeah. of sin, because they can't be free from it. Yeah. But there's a consequence of sin, yeah. which is really punishment yeah. and destruction. Yeah. So what Jesus comes to do now is to remove Oof, that. the consequence yeah. of sin. Yeah. Yeah. Not the sin. That the the that sin says. Right? Because Jesus obeyed the law no. of sin. <laughs> because we can't obey. Right? So Jesus, by obeying the law of sin, yes. moves the consequence of sin from mm. you. Because you can't, you can't live without sin. Yeah. So he removed the consequence yeah. from you. He took the punishment yeah. from you. Again, a, as I often say time and time again, everything that an evangelical teach and believe is wrong. There is not one point of truth that you could say, well, yes, the evangelical, they believe in Jesus, and we know what's meant. I have, come, I have come to understand and see based upon the gospel what we hold at seven days, that, that, that is the pure gospel. Everything what they teach is wrong. Everything. Be, 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 because truth and error is, is systematic. Yeah. You, you can't start wrong and yeah, end up right. True. If you start right, you will end up right. And that is how truth, how truth is. And that is why we, yeah. we make mention how with Calvin, when Calvin established what he, he believed in predestination, he was, his premise was wrong. But while it was wrong, it followed a course of reasoning. And that course of reason, reasoning, others came after and they were true and loyal to that reasoning. Yeah. So I'm saying in evangelical circles, the premise is wrong, the start wrong, yeah. nothing those people teach are true. The idea of Christ is wrong. The idea of sin is wrong. Yeah. The idea of the plan of salvation is wrong. The, the, the idea of the judgment is wrong. The idea of man, they have distorted the whole gospel. So, so you, you can't really rely on, and you know, I watched Van Spiral and them in the Adventist Church write some, some book about common ground. What common ground we have with them? Boy, as far as the East is from the West, our teachings is far from, from what they, they believe. There's no common ground. None. It's wrong because what kind of body Jesus the the, the, the believers had, yeah. In respect to you. Because if they say we live without sin. But you can live, live without sin. sin. Are you not saying that Actually, Jesus was no. told the friend, to you? Like what they say. They're preaching another Christ, another gospel. I mean, everything they're preaching is wrong. Another Christ, not another gospel. I mean, let me finish reading this um, um, thing because I mean, this thought came to me and it was so deep. I just write it and I say in the future, I had to do a study on, on this. It says the issue 
The issue of sin is not the body of man, but the heart of man. That is the root cause of man's sinfulness. Every sin stems from the heart of man and not his body affected by sin, but his heart infected by sin. So, so the body of man is affected by sin, but the heart of man is what? Infected. So, so the problem is the heart. Because the body which we have, which is affected by sin, Jesus had a body that was what? Affected by sin. So if Jesus had a body that was affected by sin, and when, and when, when he's affected by sin, we're talking about the infirmities and those things. I mean, he, he, was, he was hungry. He was thirsty. I mean, boy, I, I read my Bible at times. And when I get up and I read in my Bible, and I read in the Gospel of John. And I read the incident where Christ went to the, the, this well and he met the, this Samaritan woman. And I was reading Ellen White's commentary on it, boy, and boy, did this thing brought tears to my eyes. Ellen White said, imagine the savior of this world, the man who created the fountains, the heavens and the earth. She said he was dependent on another in dehydration, the thirsty and weariness to give him water to drink. I said, I said you could imagine that, boy. Christ, who created the fountains of this earth, came and stood by this well and asked this woman to give him drink. And, you know, again, it was an opportunity for, 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 for him to gain an opening wedge to actually get into discussion with her because of the prejudice and the thing in regard to the Samaritan and the Jews. But I mean, just thinking about it, I say, my goodness, this is some is something. So here we see Christ now. His body was affected by sin. But yet still, he was not infected with sin. His mind was, he had the divine mind. And I'm saying, if Christ had the divine mind with a body affected by sin, as Romans say, for he for he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, and in, it says he condemned sin what? In the flesh. So I'm saying you and I have the same opportunity to condemn sin in this same body, even as Christ condemned sin. The only difference between you and I, and it's not really no big di um, difference, is that Christ was born with, with the divine mind, you and I have to be by justification, be what? Born again. So when we are born again, we are placed on the same level with Christ. Right? Due to Adam, we lost being born with the divine mind. So the issue with these people making, the issue Adam sin and he passed on sinful nature and this and that. The issue is not nature, is not your body. So let, let, let me just finish re read out um, this thing here. So it says here that Right. The sinfulness of man, right, stems from the heart of man and not his body, affected by sin and his heart infected by sin. Thus, the experience of salvation, making sinners truly free from the experience of sin in their life, is not based or hinged on us getting new or holy body. Because that is, that is the reason why the Adventists church and evangelicals and, and them teaching because they express it in terms like this and, and, and when, when you study and you read up the writings on this thing, your mind becomes so familiar to that, you just have to hear a certain phrase and you know where they're leading to they, 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 they have this, I, this idea, justification but the idea of justification is that it is not um a change. It's not a moral. It is objective. It is, um, it is not in you. It, it, it is outside of a mule. So you don't see where they, they, they start wrong there already. So justification, as far as they concern, is objective. It's forensic. God um, views you as righteous. So when it comes to sanctification now, well again, as I say, once you start with a wrong premise, you cannot end up with a right reasoning. So justification is outside of you. The righteousness of God is not in you. It is outside in some books in heaven. So the next point is 
sanctification. Then they come and say, well, sanctification now is a work inside you. Yeah. Yeah. But when, no, 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 don't, don't, don't be too, don't be too arm um, thing. Why let's say sanctification is a work inside you? Now, mind you, they already say that the work of salvation started with something outside of you. So then, if it couldn't come in, if it couldn't address the state of man in the beginning, then whatever they identify as a work inside a man, don't, don't even look at it or think of it as, as anything because you, you get the idea of even though they, 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 because they can't escape from the fact that, that, that God has to do something because the problem of man is within man. So they can't escape it, so they come and say, well, sanctification now is God working in you. But hear what they say. While God is working in you, you still have these two nature, the old and the new man, warring against each other. So, so they present an idea of salvation, a kind of dualism. So God doing something in you, you know, but apparently like it, it, it has sin now, which is rivaling what, what, what God is doing in you. So, so the, uh, the idea of sanctification is this idea of a battle. battle. And the idea of this battle is, a, is, 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 not, is not to say it's a battle that God could gain the victory. No. It's just a battle telling you, giving you the, 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 the impression, well, brother, well, you still need to try to, yeah. to fight and a fight. Yeah. Don't give up, but... But don't, don't, don't ever hope or think that, that you can gain the victory. That that idea of gaining the victory is not, is not a, rea a reality. So, so it's like the elusive carrot in front of the uh, rabbit and he just keep running and he, he will never, because the tight on, on, on a string and it's in front of, of, of him. So just continue trying to ask. Yeah. So... So then, they come to the third part now. Because, again, did they say justification yeah. is your, um, your holy name, your title yeah. to heaven. Yeah. That is, now, 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 that title to, he to heaven is not something in you. It's not a work in you. Then they say sanctification, which I explain as a struggle, yeah. dualism. They say that is your fitness for heaven. And they come now to the final part now, glorification. Now, it, now, you have to understand when they say glorification, what they mean by Because when they say glorification, they simply mean at the resurrection, you will be given a new body. And that new body is, is only then you are considered to be free from the presence of sin. So, as far as they are concerned, as long as you are in this body, the presence of sin, you can never be free. So as Dean was rightly saying, the idea is really salvation in sin. So all, all the bitter wrong, the bush, they want to bitter wrong the bush and come and tell you the blood, the blood, and accept the blood, and you say, and all I do is stupid talk. Because dear them, challenge them. The blood, the blood, salvation, are you free from sin? Could you be free from sin? That is another story. So those people are really hypocrites. They preach some, something, but really what they're preaching is of no value, is of no substance. It can't do nothing for you, it can't do nothing for me. It can't do nothing for them. But, but they just want you, you to go along with, with this idea that, that, that brother, salvation is, is a subtle thing. God justify you, Christ obey for you, and God will glorify you in Jesus' name. So, that is what they have. Does the experience of salvation making sinners truly free from the experience of sin in their life is not based or hinged on us getting new or holy body? To be then truly free from the presence of sin at some later time. So, so, so their idea is that you're walking the um, fight of faith, but you have to look towards some expectation of being free from the present of sin in some later time. Not now. Not, not a justification. It's at a later time you would be free from the presence of sin, right? 
at some later time when we are given new bodies. If this were true, so again, I'm trying to, uh, to um, show that, uh, that that idea of salvation, if, if, let me say, it is the true, right? If this were true, then it would only make sense to save man from the experience of sin that he should be given a new body at conversion first. So, so then, if, if that idea of salvation, what, what you say, then I'm saying, I ain't no rocket science yes, to see that, 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 that well, 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 according to that idea, then the best thing God should do is that when God justifies man, he's supposed to uh, time get what, a new body, a new nature, one time. Because why would God justify you knowing that you have some sin nature? Did that, that in making sense and knowing that it's only when he gives you the, the, this new body, then you, you'll be free. I'm saying why God will just give you the, the new body one time at justification and the issue of salvation will, will, will be such a simple thing. But these people, again, it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah. So then, just that alone show what they're saying is not true. Right? So, I'm saying then, if this were true, then it would only make sense to save man from the experience of sin that he should be given a new body at conversion first and not at a later time. This would have made perfect sense in the plan to save man. But at last, this is not so. So again, that is the little thing what I wrote out and I just going through and, and, and like the more I started to look at this and you're starting to see the connection of all the other false teachings of the evangelism because you're just seeing without understanding what I showed you and with the charts and, and you know how I had the charts to show the plan of salvation and what not, boy. You could see these ideas can't fit in with that chart, boy. It can't fit in. It, can't, it just can't work. So one have to come to this point now and say, boy, is, is, is either I, I accept this or I accept that. And I'm saying this is nothing worth accepting. It's nothing worth accepting. So um, we have here now the judgment. Coming back to um, the issue of the judgment. Our idea of salvation plays a very, very important role in us really seeing the relevance and, and seeing the, the, the importance in the, the um, judgment. I mean, these people and them, they hear this, te this teaching with a passion. I, I, I mean, I don't know what these people and them, boy, as you started to talk about obedience to God's law, but it's a problem. It's all kind of thing, that, all kind of excuse, reason, all kind of scripture that they bring in to try to twist and say, no, it's, it's not that. As you talk about um, works, that you, you need to have, oh, no, boy, thy false doctrine. And you know, they try to belittle the works of faith to really mean nothing. But we know the, script, the scripture show that works of faith has it's part to play. Because if God justifies you and he makes you righteous, then it means then sanctification, which simply is the maintenance of that righteous state you have. And how, how are you maintaining it? You're maintaining it the same way you receive it, the same way you maintain it, by faith. The, the scripture says the just shall live by what? By faith. That is sanctification there. Yeah, because God makes you righteous by faith at justification. And sanctification is you walking in the light. Continually walking in the light, step by step, moment by moment, as God constantly imparts faith. And you walk in, I know as the, script, as the scripture in the Gospel of John, it says, if we say that we are in the light, and we walk not according to the light, it says, we make his word a, a lie, and we are not in the truth, but we are in what? Darkness. So that there, typical sanctification. If you have the light, which is that light, yeah, it means the light supposed to be what? Sanctifying you. So, so you're walking in the light. You know, 
having some studies with a woman goes to an evangelical church, and I'm trying to you know, help her to understand the order of the gospel, you know, systematic, in, in a systematic way. Because I think that that is one of the problems too. People's minds are so confused with false doctrine. They're confused that, watch me, you really have to have patience with, with people and a boy. You have to have patience. Because I could speak now and say, boy, well, false doctrine and, and thing, but I could remember in my earlier sta stages, I didn't understand everything. But it took me a while to understand things like that, that now I could see things clear now. As, Jim, as Jimmy Cliffs, I can see clearly now. I can see clearly God love for the sinner. The plan what God has put into operation to save man is so, such a perfect plan. If they have nothing that could compare to that plan. And yet still, I mean, I could say, well, yeah, but I understand and I see you know, all the connection, but at one point I wasn't able. It, 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 it had many, many things I had to come to take time to see. So, so you could imagine a person out there in those evangelical churches and those in the Adventist church who haven't really come to understand, but I mean, I really, I really feel sorry for um, these people. And it should place a burden upon us now to, 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 to have more patience, to have, sometimes we, we have to suffer and, and endure all kind of thing, all sorts of thing. And it does pay out. So here I am with this woman having some studies with, with her. She going to some evangelical church. But she recognized from when I meet her and we talk and I explain certain things, she recognized how clear others explain things and, and, and make it, you know, it's like nobody have ever explained things about the Bible to her mind so clear until she with her own mouth said, and she from now on, boy, you is my teacher, boy. <laughs> and, she, and she, you have a way you just explain the scripture, boy. And while I am there having the, the study, of course, you know, you would encounter many of the confusion in people's mind. And you have to be patient like, like a, when, you know, like a person with a little child. Big woman, you know, in her mid-50s, going on to still 60. And this woman, her mind is like a little child. I had to take my time, break down things, explain it. And, and when she see it, when she see the sense in what it is, boy, she does rejoice. So, the here am I, trying to explain her to, to understand the gospel. And I had to step by step and then show, I'm, I'm sure what I did. Three simple pr principles I try to, to, to establish because some people, they're not that bright. bright. Some, they, and it's not just bright only, they, they don't have that mental capacity to really grasp things the way how other minds might grasp things. So, you know, sometimes you, you, you have to recognize the people you're witnessing to. You know, don't be arrogant and don't be like, you know, up, up, up on the hill and, and just preach fire and brim, brimstone and you ain't have no regard for a person's level or where there is at, at their spiritual growth and you expect them to just understand things and the grasp things and to, you know, to see results one time. Sometimes I preach to, to um, people and I don't see re results at all. But I not let, let that be a discouragement to, to me. I have to continue because I recognize the long suffering and patience God had towards me. I can re remember me, many times I fall, falter going back to my previous life. And God had to come back and, you know, you know always remember the um, scripture. It says, all we are like what? Sheep. And have what? Gone astray. And that is how sheep are. Sometimes they go astray. But Christ is like the good shepherd. You know the script, the, the script that says Christ left 99 sheep and went seeking one lost sheep. And that shows how, how God is really loved. And even though we may Fault and go at the wayside. Christ comes in search 
of us. But we need to recognize and understand that. And we need to work towards it and not work against it. You know, and I remember my boy, huh, sometimes, it, you, you know, the, the conviction day and you, you study how God had to be patient with you. So when you now have to deal with somebody, you have to have pa patience. You, you can't always expect to get results one time. As they tell a person something, you expect they, um, they apply it or they grasp it. And here am I with this woman going through simple things. I said three simple things. I break it down as simple. Salvation is what God has done for you, what God has done in you, and what God can do through you. So it's, it's just those three things. And, and, and with that, I allow her to build an understanding on that. What has God done for you? And I point to the merits of Christ. Christ came, he died, heavenly sanctuary, Christ is the high priest. All of these works of Christ, which we understand, yeah. all, all of those um, things what we understand to be the merits of um, Christ. Is what Christ has done for us. It took, it, took, it took me a while to understand that. Because I always remember read, uh, reading in spirit of prophecy about the merits of Christ and the merits of Christ. And I'm like, but what is, what, how can this merit of, how can, how can the merits of Christ save me? Because we are told that, that, that we are not saved by our own merit. And I get that point to say, right, well, there's nothing I could do that could save me. We well, often hear about this merit of Christ and, and element what say we need to trust the merits of Christ. Trust in the, but, but what is this merit of, um, of, 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 of um, Christ? How does that really um, save anybody or bring salvation? In? And it's years I, I had to come to understand. And I'm saying today, safely by the grace of um, God, I come to appreciate what the merit of Christ can do and has done for us. You know, it, it is by the merits of, of Christ that. that Point us to a loving Savior. Was not for was not for for the merits of um, Christ, we would be trusting to self. So so the merits of, of um, Christ replace self confidence. It replaces man's attempt to want to save himself. And it, it, it's so simple. The fruits of the merits of Christ is ready to bring what? A heart of contrition. You know? A heart where you come to see you are sinful. And even though you, you are sinful, you can't do nothing to change that sinfulness of yourself. You know, as the guy sung in the song, Amazing Grace, that saved us, a wretch like me. That is what the merits, the, the, the merits of Christ is to make you see the wretchedness the hopelessness of your sin and yourself. And it's when that knowledge, it is really the knowledge of what the merit of Christ teaches then. When that knowledge comes home to your heart of your wretchedness, don't care what you do, you can't do nothing. So then what is left to do? If you can't do nothing, what next is left to do that you could be saved? Surrender. Surrender. Lord Jesus said, you know, and the, the um, parable with the, um, with the publican and the um, Pharisee. What, what, what did the publican say? The scripture said he didn't even look up to heaven. So it showed humility. He, so he felt so terrible about his sin that he wouldn't even look up to heaven. He bowed his head. And he beat his chest. He said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. So the merits of Christ caused us to see the sinfulness of our um, sin. We come to, re to recognize our need and dependence for salvation. And that there, that there is salvation. What God has done for you. Now what he has done for you creates a change in you. Which is called justification. The, the new birth. So after you see all of that, what Christ has done for the accomplishment of your salvation... It does a work in, in your heart and cause you now to want to what? Give up your sin. To want to then turn to God in contrition. Turn to God in penitence. You know, confession, repentance, and all of these things is what 
the provision of God or the merits of Christ is geared to work toward. Christ said, ah, if I be lifted up, well, what? Draw all men. That is what the work of Christ has done, is capable in doing. So, Lift up, lift up Christ. Yeah, that is the whole point. Like lift, up tail, lift up self, lift, lift up knowledge, lift up all kind of thing, but not Christ. To show that they can be seeking in every way. Yeah. Or they can be seeking you in some argument, but they may not really lift lifting up Christ. Christ. Yeah. They may not consider about the faith. But how much they could discern that they are wrong. Oh, man, how much they could, yeah. And they could put right. And how they could identify for doctrine. Uh, is the same spirit. Up, up, and, up, up and on the hill. That, that is the assurance. Christ says, if he be lifted up, he will draw be. all so men. So it's not a common continuous church where you lift, lift up, up men. men. Lift up yourself, lift yeah. up your, your intelligence, but really it should be the use of an instrument or a church to lift up really Christ, yeah. the person. Amen. And with that, the person has no choice but to see. Yeah. And, and then see Jesus as their only savior and hope. So again, these are the things that, that, that needs to be dwelt on. And it is this foundational understanding that, that, that caused Jones and Wagner to come up with the method of righteousness by faith. Because in studying, they come to recognize that this teaching, Ellen White herself say, she said she and I will never even preached that teaching yeah. so clear as those two um, uh, umbrellas. She said every fiber in her being rejoiced when she, when she heard the message because of how they presented Christ. As she said, the message presented Christ as surety. A surety for all, a surety to, to the sinner. The sinner needs to see Christ in such a way that they must that they must be able to look away from the sin. Despite the wretchedness you, you, are, you are seeing, they must be able to look away to that and see the glory of, of um, Christ. And that there is the beginning of the road to salvation. That there brings a new boat. That brings justification and so forth. But it doesn't stop there. You know, as, as I say again, salvation is a process. It's not something where you're, you're you know, one save, always save. It, 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 it is a process. Because of, again, you see the wisdom of um, God. Because pe people can accept Christ now, and they're going good today. They're going good three, three months, four months, two years, and by the third year, they, they fall back, they, they turn back. So then, this idea of one save, always save. Again, all of this idea is based upon a false idea of justification. That somehow, the salvation what those people conceive in their mind facilitates sin. Yeah. It facilitates the experience of sin in the person that the person could still continue to walk and think that they're saved, but they're in sin. I'm saying when we get the real true understanding of the gospel, it has no grounds for, uh, for, uh, for um, sin. You falter, you're going back to your same state. And if there's any restoration, God has to do over the work that, that he has done to restore you back. And then you, you um, move on. And again, as you know, salvation, as Paul said, we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That is the study what I'm, I'm doing. Um, the progressive work of sanctification you working out your salvation is you taking time to reflect, to think upon yourself. To, you, 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 you know, you're always being reflective. You're always examining. If you, the minute you fail to examine and to reflect, is there where Satan come, comes in and we start to get complacent. We, we, we start to get this kind of love, love of ease. If we're not seeing ourselves growing in grace, if we're not seeing the sinfulness of sin daily, we have cause to, um, to worry. Um, justification and the judgment goes hand in hand. 
If, if, if you are not justified in the right way, then you can't face a judgment. If, it, if justification as an understanding is wrong, it's not a, 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 a right understanding, as the scripture shows, then how could you really, really face a judgment? A judgment which the standard of that judgment is the law of our God. A judgment, you know, as we understand, this judgment does not make mistakes. This judgment has no appeal. This judgment is a judgment according to truth. Everything that this judgment deals with, it ain't no mistake. And it ain't no um, lack of evidence. I mean, the books are there open. Your whole life is recorded. So, you have this idea of justification that doesn't change you, that, that doesn't make you holy. How, how could you think about even standing in, 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 in a judgment? And that is why they, they have to make up all, all kind of fictitious theories about books in heaven and, and Christ obeying your place. All of these fictitious theories is to really cover up the lack of the truth in us. They don't have the truth, so they have to make up as they go along. Because the scripture says um, the judgment of, of God is perfect. It, 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 you know, the judgment looking at what Christ do in your place. You know, the judgment, the law could only see the transgressor. The law ain't, ain't going to say, well, Jesus died in your place. And you know, the law see you as a transgressor. The law is crying out for your blood. Yeah, it says the soul that sinned, it shall surely die. So, so, so then when, when you come with an idea telling people that justification is this and you, you can live in anyhow, you're cursing them because you're not making them have the right view of salvation that, that, that could place them in a right perspective to, to live in accordance to facing a judgment. Yeah, brother. 